Aloha and welcome to another episode of Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin, and today we're talking about community-supported fisheries. We're joined by Jason Chow, the operations manager at Local IA. So thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me, uh, Hunter. So today we're talking community-supported fisheries, um, fresh local pono. And this is, you know, over the years we've had a pretty good development of community-supported agriculture as a model, and that's sort of begun taking root in different parts of the state. Um, but it uh, seems like you guys are really sort of taking a novel approach to, to uh, that direct sales, increased benefit to producers. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, about what Local E is and, and how you got into it. Yeah, so, um, so Local E, it's, uh, it's being incubated by uh, Conservation International Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> And which, which means is they're, they're providing us uh, technical expertise uh, resources to start our business. Um, so Local IA, as you said, is a, it's an adaptation of the CSA model. So instead of working with, um, with small um, farms or a single farm, we're working with uh, fishermen and small boat commercial fishermen. Um, when the fish ponds do go up and in operation, then hopefully we can uh, source from fish ponds, which would be great. Um, some aquaculture. Um, operations here in Hawaii and we're working with them direct buying seafood directly from them and processing it and distributing it straight to the consumer um, similar very similar to the CSA model and so the CSA model for anybody not familiar is more of like a direct sales just produced on the farm in some instances places will be buying shares before mm -hmm. the season even begins and then mm -hmm. you'll get a box distributed weekly or monthly or whatever you've you've signed up for. Yeah. And I yeah. know that sometimes in, in these um, in CSAs that there's also opportunities for people to actually get involved with, with a little bit on the production end of things, mm -hmm. um, you know, with farm visits and whatnot. I imagine that's probably a little harder to pull off to, <laughs> to cram all the people purchasing from you on a boat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but are there other sort of potentials in the horizon for like a public engagement in that in yeah, other I, ends of the I chain? hope to. Uh, we're, we're working with, um, with some fish ponds um, here on Oahu. Um, the biggest one is, the, the most well-known uh, known one is uh, Pai Pai Oheia mm -hmm. up in Heia and Kaneohe. Um, and they, they obviously have, you know, their, their work days and everything like that. Um, hopefully, if, if we can, if, if they do get up to production and we buy their fish, um, I do see uh, some kind of community involvement with the fish pond. I'm, I'm, they, they, they're always looking for help. Yeah. Um, our members would hopefully they'd be more more than happy to help out and and also get some some fish out of their pond or some limu they're harvesting limu um, out of that pond too. Nice. Um, one really really neat update about Heia specifically is that they just got I'm not sure about the number they they got a few thousand um, fingerlings of mullet mm. um, sponsored by Conservation International, um, the Castle Foundation. Um, and so they, they stocked the pond with these fingerlings, and hopefully within, uh, I think, a year and a half to two years, um, they'll be up to market size. Nice. Yeah. So you mentioned Conservation International a couple of times. So that's a, a national, well, international, I guess I should say, a <laughs> nonprofit organization mm -hmm. of which there are various local chapters or branches. Yes, yes. Um, so what, what's sort of their mission or what's so, that about? So Conservation International has, has many field offices um, around the world. Hawaii is the only uh, field office in the U.S. Mm. Um, specifically, the, the Conservation International Hawaii program, um, they focus on seafood security in Hawaii. Um, a lot of people talk about food security um, around the world, but CI Hawaii is focused more on seafood, se seafood security. How, how much seafood do we have in Hawaii? How much are we producing? How much are we consuming? And can we sustain ourselves? Seafood-wise, it's a really important question. I mean, a lot of my work is, is focused on food security, but it's mm -hmm. sort of interesting to even feel the the wet boundaries of mm -hmm. of just the way that I've often contextualized that, where the the considerable resources that we have um, within the ocean are, are you know something that we're also readily tapping from, but need to be just as aware of how we manage. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's. It's very interesting because the Hawaiians used to, that was their main source of protein, right, is fish. And nowadays we kind of kind of forget about fish and we kind of throw fish. Um, we, we separate that from agriculture and livestock, but in actuality, you know, we're, we're harvesting protein. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's a, it's, it's a real necessity to, 
to incorporate fisheries into the conversation. Well, and particularly from a management perspective, when you start recognizing that you know what we do on the land can greatly affects what exactly. happens in the sea. Looking at you know the degradation of fish ponds or silting of reefs and all of the other uh, work to be done. I guess mm -hmm. you could say. Um, so how did how did you get into this? What what led you to this position? Yeah. So I was uh, I grew up fishing um, my whole life. I was I think I learned how to swim. My 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 parents enrolled me in swimming lessons, I think, when I was seven or eight years old. Um, I, and as soon as I got semi-proficient with swimming, my uncles took me out diving with them. Um, I was 13 when I got my first three-prong. It was a six-foot fiberglass yellow three-prong. Which, um, which I think is still the only kind of three-prong <laughs> I own. Um, rusty, day glow. Rusty, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and yellow so they could see me and not lose me because I was just barely staying afloat. Um, but yeah, somehow that that um, escalated into me actually loving the ocean um, and loving the resources and just being out there floating around with them. Um, eventually, I learned how to fish. Um, I graduated from the yellow six foot three prong. Um, <laughs> One day, maybe I'll get <laughs> And. And yeah, so that's, I, I did that all throughout elementary school, all throughout high school. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I went to college on the mainland for three years. Um, when, I, when I was coming back for Christmas and summertime, I, I started working with the fish auction, the United Fishing Agency who runs the Honolulu Fish Auction. Um, so I was down there, I was shoveling ice at five in the morning. I was helping the fishermen unload their catch <clears throat> sorting fish, um, but my main job was to write receipts for buyers, mm -hmm. and it was there that I got to see pretty much a lot of, you know, 90% of the fish that comes in through Hawaii comes in through, or are, are fresh fish, right, comes in through that auction, um, and then I got to see how the buyers interact with each other and also where the fish goes, um, and it kind of opened my eyes to see what is the, it was the very first um, introduction to seafood in Hawaii, to me, um, the seafood industry in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, at the producer point, right, the fisherman point of view. Um, so is, is the auctions, I mean, when I think of fish auction in my, my head, it looks sort of like, a, like an 80s Wall Street clip <laughs> where it's just people screaming, sort of wild acronyms, yeah, and throwing pieces of paper at each other. Is that, is that what it's like? Or it's kind the, of, well, it's, it's actually the very opposite of that. Um, it's noisy in the fact that there's a lot of like pallets going around, there's ice shoveling, um, but verbally there's not very much people talking. It's um, silent auction. It's, it's, it's almost like a silent auction. They, literally, they, there's an auctioneer, auctioneer, right? He, he starts off his, his bidding and everything, and, and the buyers, they just like do the flick of the wrist or a little nod of the head yeah. or something. That's, that, it, that's the exchange. That's, that's the exchange, okay. yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's almost a silent auction like that, yeah. In a sense, so you, then you got to see the sort of uh, beginnings of the, the industry side. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and then after, <clears throat> so when I graduated, I graduated with a degree in biology from UHM, um, UH at Manoa. I came home um, to finish school. And after that, there were really no jobs in biology in the marine realm, um, which is what I wanted to go into. And then so I, <laughs> I did a kind of 180 and I, went into cooking. And I've, I've always wanted to cook. I always loved to cook. So I cooked professionally for about a year and a half, two years. Um, and that brought me into, into a lot of, into a few different kitchens that are, that are very you know, well known here in Hawaii. And that, and, and that end, I got to see the end product of the fish that I was working with at the auction. Right? Mm. Um, I got to see kind of the full circle and how restaurants buy um, fish and how much people are consuming just out of that one restaurant, right? Um, and then after that, I, I figured that it's not the job for me. <laughs> I can't do this for the rest of my life. I can't stay 25 for the rest of my life and, and keep, you know, pushing 12-hour days on my feet. Yeah. Um, so I got out of that and I got an internship with uh, Kupu, uh, with their RISE program, Rewarding Internships for Sustainable Employment. And I think that uh, that was 
what that's really what brought me here today I think um, mm. so they they set you Kubu sets you up with a an organization to do a specific project yeah. um, and I got set up with Conservation International and my project was to it was a beast of a project it was to to assess how much seafood or to, to do a seafood security assessment of Hawaii um, and so so that that That's kind of tied into um, what, what I'm doing today. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it seems like you really had this this whole supply chain of experience from mm. fishing to working at the auction to then working as a you know at the the, the plate end of things, and then uh, j jumped into that position with Rise, where you're sort of looking at it from this this whole scope. So yeah, well, cool. Well, thanks for sharing us. We're going to take a quick break, but join us back here after these messages. Hi, my name is Sachiko Slomov. I'm the floor manager of ThinkTech Hawaii here. Uh, you can join us on the air every weekday from 1 to 5 or off the air at thinktechhawaii.com. We stream all of our videos and all of our amazing, like, amazing shows ho, 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 at thinktechhawaii.com or on our Ustream channel. You can also check us out on Twitter at thinktechhi or Instagram at thinktechhi also. I'll be listening and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks that you think should be on it, let us know. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. All right, aloha, and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. Today we're talking about community-supported fisheries, fresh, local, and pono. And we're joined by Jason Chow, the operations manager at Local IA. And so you were just telling us about kind of what brought you uh, to this chair and to the position that you're <laughs> in today. Um, having this sort of wealth of experiences going through the the diversity that is the, the seafood supply chain here in the islands from working um, or from enjoying the water as a fisherman and diver to working at the auctions and then restaurants and then you were just getting into uh, the work that you were doing with Kupu as an intern for Conservation International. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the, the project, it was, a, it was assessing how much seafood we have here in Hawaii, which is, it was very hard to do. I, I think I think the term I used was impossible. <laughs> impossible our, to do. Our meeting before this, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's it's it was it was more. It wasn't really necessarily trying to find the answers. Mm -hmm. It was trying to develop the metrics to measure, um, to, to to come about um, the answers. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the big takeaways of the project was we don't. It was to identify what key things do we need to know in order to assess how much how seafood security is Hawaii mm -hmm. to identify these um, these indicators and if we don't have the the answers for these indicators is how can we get these answers mm -hmm. um, that was one of the biggest takeaways of the project finding out what we know we don't know kind of, yeah Something yeah like and how 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 to find it out yeah. is was I think was the the key takeaway huh um, but mid midway through the project, I was offered by Conservation International a full-time position. And who, you know, right out of As all college, interns hope yeah, for, yes. Yeah, you're, sure, I'll get a full-time position. Um, so that it kind of uh, drew me away from um, this project, the seafood security assessment. But um, somebody else from CI picked it up. Mm. And it should be published um, by the end of the year. Nice. Yeah. Um, so that's a really, it's going to be just really exciting uh, to see that something that I started kind of um, 
be developed a little bit more. Well, and from a sort of from a food security perspective, as, as obviously works towards. I mean, that's, that's really critical data that I know that there's been some work mm -hmm. um, on it. Not so much from a farm production side, but just from our food system uh, statewide overall. And it's a exceedingly complex web of uh, interactions of local forces and, and sort of international ones yeah. and reg different regulatory processes and tracking mechanisms that it yeah. becomes very uh, you know, data, data yeah. key, data yeah. intensive, but also um, often working in a, in a dearth of data. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the, the food aspect. Um, this this metrics is actually being tied into uh, the Hawaii Green Growth Initiative, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's being tacked on to the the agriculture metrics um, that I think Kevin Vaccarello is leading up. Mm -hmm. So it's it's being tacked on as kind of an egg component um, because they have you know they have produce, they have um, beef, eggs, milk, and then they have a separate one for seafood. Wow, yeah. cool. Um, so what are we what are we looking at on this image here? Oh, so this is um, this is a software that we are we are employing um, through um, through our CSF, and it's a, it's a way of providing transparency about where your fish is coming from. Um, this this software is called This Fish, and it's a software that's based up in Canada. Um, but basically, as as you can see, the the fisherman tags his fish, and it's each fish is assigned a specific barcode, or a lot of fish, your five mahi-mahi from a specific boat, your five mahi-mahi would get one barcode. <clears throat> then after that, it comes to us, we cut it up, we, dish, we cut it up and we uh, pack it into one and a half to two pound portions, or about three to four servings, and then we distribute it to the consumer. The consumer end sees a barcode, a numeric code, or a QR code, and they then Im go to our website, or you can go to this, the, this fish website, and you input the code. And the code pulls up uh, a page that says exactly where your fish is from, who caught your fish, what day it was caught. And that's one problem that, we, that, that I think the seafood industry in Hawaii is lacking. They don't really, a lot of people don't really know where their fish is coming from. Um, a lot of the, the, the movement right now is towards, um, towards local produce and locally grown things. Mm -hmm. um, every, a lot of people know Whole Farms. A lot of people know Nalo or Otsuji Farms. Not everyone knows, you know. Can, can name a single fisherman. Yeah, not everyone yeah. knows Captain Joe from Wainai. Nobody does, except his family. Um, hmm. So it's essentially like a UPS, USPS tracking <laughs> system, right? Like you log I in know, and you yeah. see. This is where my fish was caught. Mm -hmm. This was uncle who grabbed it out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, and then every step of the supply chain before then, or mm -hmm. that they got it to you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And uh, that doesn't even exist with, with produce. I mean, you can still see, you might see a recognized local brand at the store. Yeah. And you know it was from the farm, but all the different places it went in between, mm -hmm. there isn't necessarily a, a, a consumer accessible um, data tracking system for that. Mm -hmm. So this is a really, really novel model. And I think in, in seafood, just seafood in general, right, a lot of people <coughs> um, that have eaten seafood will t automatically tell you fresher is always better. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, <coughs> it doesn't really matter where your, your seafood came from. The freshest seafood is always the best. Um, and and this, this, we hope, provides more of a transparency about how fresh is your seafood. And also, where your fish is coming from? Is it coming? Is it locally caught seafood, or is it being imported? And naturally, if it's imported, it will be older than if Captain Joe caught it this morning. Mm -hmm. So the the process, is, I mean, it sounds like you're really shortening the supply chain. I mean, you're cutting out a lot of these middlemen mm -hmm. and um, increasing sort of the the, the transparency of, of this entire process. From a consumer knowledge standpoint, this seems to be very powerful, right? Because mm -hmm. it, we can, you know, like fish, we appreciate it, might say local, but that, when, you know, one of the things that you brought up was like, what is, what even defines a local fish? So mm -hmm. in terms of your sourcing for local EA, what, how do you bound that, or what, what are the parameters? Yeah, so uh, 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 what, what we define as local fish is the fish that is caught in Oahu waters, because we are a community-supported fishery. Our community is 
the, the island of Oahu. Um, all of our fishermen are based on Oahu. They live on Oahu. They have families on Oahu. And they fish in Oahu waters. Um, to me, like, Mo Molokai people have Molokai fish. Maui people have, Mo have Maui fish. Um, it's, it's their fish, and they have the right to take it. And we don't have the right to take their fish. So that's a very far cry from I mean, defining localized. And I bought it at the fish auction. Mm. And hence, it was from the Pacific. But that's a pretty broad uh, swath of locality. <laughs> you know, we could say mm -hmm. it wasn't flown here from Vietnam, but it was maybe caught a thousand miles from here, <laughs> 500 miles from here. So it seems like you guys have really done a nice job of identifying the fisheries and, and the, the, the communities that you're working with. Mm -hmm. What was the process like to, to um, terrible pun, to fish out like who, who you were going to be working with um, mm -hmm. that are uh, of the local producer community? Um, well, well, one thing we, we want to um, stress is, is um, supporting the fishermen, for one, and two is to ensure that their catch, <coughs> that they, their, their catch, they're, they're fishing in Pono fishing ways. Um, we, we developed a, a Pono fishing standard. Um, Pono fishing means the, the right way of fishing. Mm -hmm. And it's something that Hawaiians used to do. Um, some people do practice, do continue to practice this. And at the core of it is sustainability, right? It's to ensure that you have fish for your future generations. Hawaiians knew this, and they practiced this in every aspect um, of fishing. And so we took that, and we've kind of, um, we, we merged it with the MSC standard or the Marine Stewardship Council standard. It is the, it's uh, the most widely recognized marine certification. It's kind of like a, like a USDA organic stamp, um, but it's it's an international um, certification. Um, a, another widely no, widely known one is the uh, Seafood Watch from Monterey Bay Aquarium. So it's very similar to that. So we took their, the criteria that they have, we adapted it to Hawaii, um, we, and we added in the cultural aspect, the pono fishing aspect of it, um, which includes spawning seasons. It includes um, knowing your resource a little bit, a little bit more intimate um, than what some people um, don't know. Mm. Are we able to get that image back up there? So this is your, your business model. I mean, looking at the, it seems like it only says fishers benefit on one end, but it, I feel like there's benefits essentially entire, <laughs> entirely through the chain. So talk, uh -huh. us, talk us through this model. Yeah, so, um, so where, where it says fishers benefit, obviously, um, since, since like you said, Hunter, we're cutting out the middlemen in a sense, um, we, hope to, we hope to push more profitability to the fishermen and incentivizing them in fishing in, in Pono fishing ways, right? Um, this, these incentives may be, you know, a higher price for your fish or they may just be higher marketability for your fish. Um, we, I, I don't want to venture to, to guarantee that we're going we're gonna to pay the fishermen more than what they're getting. Um, but hopefully we can at least, at least provide them a steady market um, that at a steady price. Well, unfortunately, one of the things that you that we were talking about earlier was uh, you had made mention of sort of, sort of the economics of it and, and the shift towards a demand side mm -hmm. um, management in a sense mm -hmm. where it's based off of you know what the consumer demand is so that you don't end up with these sort of pricing gluts where it's like, oh, we got, we, this is what we could get, so we put, brought it all in, and then the price drops, and people don't want it, so it goes bad, and the fishermen don't make money, mm -hmm. um, and kind of nobody's happy, and it is decreasing our capacity to feed ourselves yeah. in the future, so. And, and it's, uh, and, and that's, that's one thing about fishing, too, is if the fishermen, if the fish are biting, fishermen have to catch, because they don't know if the fish, if the, that fish stops biting tomorrow, they just missed out, you know, on a thousand dollars. And and the really really neat thing I think about the CSF is that, and and with the CSA model is that, 
customers pay up front and they receive whatever is in season. And in this case, it's whatever the fishermen are catching. Um, and it, it kind of works in the fisheries advantage. Like to, in event, it's an advantage to the fisheries itself because we can kind of take pressure off certain types of fish like ahi, mahi, mahi, and kind of spread it out over the entire ecosystem to, to kind of take a little pressure off of the heavily um, fished fish. Mm -hmm. And also to expand people's taste to different fish. A lot of people don't even know what kala tastes like. Um, kala is an excellent fish. Pretty tasty. Um, so juicy cheeks. Juicy. Oh, I've never had kala cheeks before. Awesome. That was the one bit I was sold to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, kala is a it's a really really good fish, and a lot of people don't eat it, um, just because they just don't know. And that's that's one really neat aspect of the CSF is that we can we can provide this type of fish to a consumer base as well as recipes and that, mm. that teach them how to cook their fish, how to prepare their fish, how to store their fish. Um, and it also kind of kind of gives other species a, a, a little bit of a break yeah. in, a, in a sense to, to repopulate and um, and then you know the next week we'll probably offer ahi or something. And, Keep everyone happy. So, from a from a consumer standpoint, then I mean, what a, we sign up. There's a prepayment. It's a weekly, monthly. Uh, if when the fish happen to show up, I mean, like how do you smooth <laughs> out the bumps between these different things? Yeah, yeah, we're 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 trying to work. I mean, our fishermen are fishing whenever the fish are biting, right? mm -hmm. you know, and it's and we're we're trying to work with our fishermen to kind of have a little window, like you know, you can fish. Try and fish between, you know, Friday and Saturday, or Friday, Sunday, and and then we would pick up their fish, uh, process it, distribute it, on the consumer end. And so you guys, but so you guys have in-house processing or like yes, a facility. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're um, working. We're working with Kamiki Superette, mm, um, yeah. the 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 sister of a town restaurant mm -hmm. with Ed Kenny. Um, so we are we just signed our lease with him. Nice. We're gonna sign it soon, <laughs> and um, and we're processing out of his kitchen. So two days a week, which is a commercial kitchen, which is a commercial kitchen. Gets, it's yeah. already certified. Um, he's being great in that he's he's giving us a walk-in space, and he also has an ice machine. So that's there. good to hear. For yeah, the fish. Yeah, being oh, yeah. cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we're keeping we're keeping our fish um, fresh and at temperature at all times. Um, I've worked since I worked in the restaurant industry. You know. Um, so yeah, so we, as a, for the consumer, you would you would choose whether it's a month, three months, six months, or a year of subscri subscriptions, and you would sign up online, and then there you would receive um, fish every week. All right. Well, you consumers can choose to stick around. Hopefully, it won't be three months. Take a quick break. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. Today we're talking about community-supported fisheries, fresh, local pono. We're joined by Jason Chow, the operations manager at Local IA, and you were just talking us through um, your supply chain with going from working with fishermen and sort of helping um, make sure that their catches are, are getting to you as fresh as possible, and then that's going to the incubator kitchen or the um, commercial kitchen space at Kaimuki Superette, mm -hmm. and there it gets 
wined and dined or sliced and diced or something to that effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is, I, I think it depends on, um, on what kind of fish we get to. Is if, we, if we get small, you know, opelu or mackerels, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fillet 400 pounds of mackerel. That's not, <laughs> not gonna happen. But, but if we do have mackerel, right, and, we, and the consumer gets some um, mackerel in their share every week, then we'll provide um, videos or recipes on how to um, best do, how to best prepare your mackerel. So, for example, I mean, this is this is the uh, this fish yeah. app. So I could conceivably be acquiring mackerel from you, uh, QR code, and then this is then telling me. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. So this um, um, this will pop up. Uh, as you notice, it says uh, your code, so that that A four six seven two nine eight whatever, it's the consumer gets that in their package of fish, um, wow. and each code is specific to that fish, that opelu, um, that's being caught by Craig, in Miloli'i, I think by Hoopnet. Um, so this will be this is an example of the fish that. Um, that customers will receive from us every week. Um, they'll have a specific code, and it's it tells the story of your fish. Um, and on that on that web page, if you want to know more about what is Opelu, there's a drop-down menu that that you can click on that'll tell you about the life history of Opelu, the spawning season, um, where it tends to live, and then if you want to know more about Uncle Craig, you can click on Uncle Craig's. Um, little tab and it tells you about his family or well, whatever the fisherman uh, wants to put on there he can put on there wow. and you can even it looks like you can even send him a note yes a yeah quick mahalo. and that's that's one really cool thing is that it it bridges the gap between the consumers and the fishermen yeah. and i think it it makes the fishermen feel better knowing that their fish is feeding families and that people are legitimately thankful for the work that they do and so within a given week, you, you might have a variability of one or two kinds of fish, or five or six conceivably, or? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's hard, once again, because it's, it's a wild fishery. It's not like a farm where you can kind of tell, you know, your eggplant is growing and it'll pop out within a week. Um, so we, it, it's, we, we, we're, we're going to try and make all of our, um, our shares as, um, as, consistent as possible, mm -hmm. so everyone would get mahi this week, everyone will get opelu this week, but if... But there's obviously yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's a wild It's system, a wild, yeah. It, yeah Which a, I think is part of, I mean, it's a very different way of kind of approaching this, but in mm -hmm. the in the foodie world, I mean, we could say, like, there's, <laughs> there's I think, been a, a push, and I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, um, that Town and, you know, with uh, Stone Barns and some of these other restaurants have really made a name for themselves um, because of how they cook, mm. or because of what they cook, but then also how they cook, and in part because of their their openness to this sort of variability that happens on farms. Like, mm. it, generally on the plate, like, you don't experience the peaks and troughs of production or um, whatnot because it gets smoothed out by um, local Im or foreign imports or other producers. Mm -hmm. And so it seems, um, there's I feel like there's been a growing trend of, like, being a restaurant that just buys whatever the farm produces and having to be creative and having to, to um, you know, try things that are that are new and novel, and it seems like that this um, shares model that you guys are offering up is really a good way to sort of expand our own palates and, mm -hmm. and taste the island in a, in a way that we maybe haven't before. So, when when you're talking about you, you mentioned sort of like oh, if you guys can fish between these this day and that day, are these all? I mean, there's also this this notion of Community-based fisheries management. So, mm -hmm. wh where does it, where does the sort of like the line between fishermen and, and fisheries manager come in, in this interaction? Yeah. So there's there's there's, there's two different kinds of, of fishermen right here in Hawaii, um, or commercial fishermen. I think there's <clears throat> there's fishermen who who fish to fish um, for the money aspect of the commercial side, and then there's fishermen who fish to feed their families, um, to feed people. Um, and and the the fishermen that we're working with, it's it's it, a lot of them are kind of the in between, right? They 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 fish to feed their families first and foremost, mm -hmm. um, and the leftover then they can 
they sell to subsidize, you know, their, their gas, their ice, their rent, um, their, their new engine on their boat, you know, stuff like that. Um, and and these, these fishermen that we're working with, they, they tend to be a little bit more tuned into their environment, um, we found. Um, you know, and it's a top cockpit trolling a mile of line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they know, they know where the, the fish run. Um, they, they know what's going on within the fisheries and, and the environment. Um, so, I mean, there, it sounds like just because of the, we're talking about sort of different scales of management, mm -hmm. right? So because of their, the interaction and to some degree, I think it sounds like in some instances the, the subsistence production bit of it is that the, the value placed on proper management or pono management of the fisheries is increased mm -hmm. because it's literally the, you know, it's not just their economic livelihood, but it's the, the food on their tables, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a, a pretty distinct um, outlook or, or type of interaction than it just being a cash machine that you just have to dip your hooks in <laughs> and pull out the money. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I've, I've always kind of had this question about, um, differing ways of managing fisheries from, I know locally that we have um, size minimums mm -hmm. generally, right? So if the fish is of a, below a certain size, pitch it back. I know that in, in some other countries that they've gone with um, maximum size, right? So if it's greater than a certain size, which normally means that it's in a, a procreation state or it's at that time of life where it can begin to spawn or, mm -hmm. or whatnot, that there's, there's sort of two schools of thought on this way of, of managing fisheries. I mean, does that apply in, in these instances? Or like, what's the yeah. what's your take? <laughs> so, um, so the state currently has uh, size limits mm -hmm. on certain fish. Um, there's commercial size limits, which means the commercial fishermen, if, if, you're, if you're selling your catch, you have to abide by certain size limits. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's recreational size limits. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, size limits, whether it be a minimum size or a maximum size or a slot limit, which means there's a, there's a certain size, you, you can only take from this size to this size. Anything mm. below, you cannot, and anything above, you cannot. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's different ways of, of creating these, these size limits, but at the end of the day, it's all about, like what you said, it's about spawning. It's about the ability for the fish to, to reproduce. And at the, if, if, if you look at sustainability, you know, up, across the board, the, the essence of sustainability is to ensure that we have more for the future. I mean, there's so many definitions that people throw around there. But at the essence of it, it's you have more for the future. You have more for our kids, and there are kids to come. Um, the Hawaiians knew this, the Hawaiians practiced this, and one way that they ensured that their fish were able to have, that they were able to have more fish for the future generations is to not take while they're spawning, mm. regardless of size. Um, and there's, there's different size limits on, on fish, you know, around, the, around just this island, um, on what size they spawn, and sometimes, due to fishing pressures, they can actually spawn at a smaller size. Hmm. Um, but spawning, the, the time at which they are harvested, um, I think is, it's, it's, it's based on, or the fishing, the size limits are based on the spawning seasons, or the spawning size, so we should look into the seasons as well as the size. So it sounds like, I mean, you're, but also within what you're saying, that there's even variability within just a Wahoo. Just a Wahoo, Let, let yeah. alone the state. So mm -hmm. we run the risk in terms of these, uh, you know, we're talking about different scales of management. There's these sort of like policy levers and policy mm -hmm. um, implementations of, of minimum size, maximum size, flat size, that we're making something that's ostensibly supposed to fit all, but is useful mm -hmm. to no one. Mm -hmm. In a sense, <laughs> like it's not right any, anywhere along mm -hmm. the chain perfectly. Um, but that we get in, you know, it sounds like that you guys are really advocating for a model of more this, this um, support of, of the people that are out there every day that do have the, the in-depth knowledge that really no one else has because they don't spend the time there. Mm -hmm. um, and though we can, you know, analyze it statistically or look at the conceptualized uh, or, or 
little bit of data that we have about you know when season when the seasons or the um, spawning sizes that that really if we're going to address what I think of as as like a a collective action problem or the, sort of the, the tragedy of the commons that we're I don't want to say coming up against but that we're we're really facing going forward in terms of like fresh fish access around the world mm -hmm. that the model that you guys are offering up is, is really I don't want to say a panacea um, but pretty good way of weaving together both the like consumer knowledge and that locally based management that's so critical for managing these things. Because yeah. at, at, at the end of the day, the, f the fishermen know more about the fisheries um, than any, anyone else. Um, I mean, I, I only know a small part because that's, I f fish in a specific area. And I know, from, I know a little bit of that area, I mean, not the whole part of it. Um, but I don't know Opelo fisheries in Mililii. Mm. I don't know, you know, the tuna fishery out in Waianae. Um, but the guys who fish it every day do. And they're the ones that, that should be in the conversation. And that's one thing that we're trying to push is we are having conversations with our fishermen weekly. That's amazing. Well, is, is there like a quick uh, wrapping takeaway of how do, we, how do people get involved? How do we track you down? Yeah, so... How uh, do we get this box of amazing, <laughs> amazing fish? Um, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, we're, we're just starting up. We're hoping to start operations um, hopefully mid-May. Mid and um, you can follow us on Facebook. Our, our website's not fully up yet. Uh, we hope to get that up within the next couple of weeks. Okay. So facebook.com slash local EA or something Local like. EA Hoi. Local EA Hoi. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show and the thank fine you. work. And join us back here next week and every Thursday for Sustainable Hawaii, the show about making the transition from being individual consumers with rights to building communities of producers with responsibilities. Aloha.